Welcome to What Healthy Couples Know That You Don't, a podcast dedicated to helping you create the relationship you truly want. Welcome. How to be more forgiving in love and dating as an experiment. Today, we're keeping it real with Rhoda about a topic that everyone can learn from. Whether you are discouraged about dating or questioning whether your relationship is good enough, we've got some great answers in our interview today. Love sets up a lot of expectations, beginning with the Disney version of fairy tales, including romance novels and our own fantasies of what love is supposed to be. When the truth is, and you've heard me say this so many times if you're a regular listener, real love is deciding to do the work of being a better person because you love somebody else. Let me repeat that because this is important and it shows how we decide to begin to grow up. We start the process of growing up by honestly facing painful situations, most often about ourselves. Real love is deciding to do the work of being a better person because you love somebody else. This is why I encourage an employee to ask a supervisor how they can improve or a parent to ask a teen, what are two ways I can be a better mom or dad? Or after a breakup to ask for honest feedback about what went wrong. These are hard conversations that can help all of us grow up. Hard conversations with specifics help us learn about the reality of how we impact others and how we can improve. We can't even begin to see ourselves accurately. We all have illusions to comfort ourselves when often blame frees us up to be the innocent victims. We all love blame. It is Marcus Aurelius who said comfort is the worst addiction. We can only grow by being partly uncomfortable, which is to risk asking for honest feedback. Nobody grows from the comfort of empathy and validation. That's why a good therapist can't rely only on empathy and validation. So real love offers us the opportunity to do the work of improvement, which we can all benefit from. All of us can do better with greater self-awareness based on believing other people. Just last night at dinner with good friends, Jeannie made a positive comment about my husband and I joked, I'm certainly the more difficult one, but at least I don't lack self-awareness. And everybody laughed. And I meant what I said. Greater self-awareness is work, and it's a whole lot easier to simply dismiss other people instead of considering what to learn from a tiff. When we take ownership of our own dark side, then we find it easier to forgive others for their dark side. We all have to accept that part of being human is also being a jerk. When I have to work at forgiving myself, episode episode 124 offers lots of help with this, then it's a whole lot easier to forgive others. We all have much we can improve upon. Dating is very hard work because it's about the mysterious beginnings or ends of relationships, and generally there's not enough solid information to go on. Dating is a dance in the unknown with a suffocating amount of confusion and uncertainty, not anybody's favorite things. It's buried in false starts and promises from people who disappear, then lack of real information to understand what the hell happened and what's going on can be soul crushing. So dating needs a light touch. Consider it a series of experiments and an opportunity to practice being more authentic. When we are authentic about ourselves with ourselves, then we can reduce the gap between our expectations and reality. We bring our dark side to the relationship, and so do they. So how can we do better at figuring out things 
together with more authentic conversations. So to help us think about how to do the work of love and understand how to make things better, I've invited Todd Baratz to join us today. He is a renowned psychotherapist and sex therapist whose innovative approach to mental health and relationships has established him as a leading figure in his field. In addition to his clinical practice. Baratz is a prolific writer and just finished his newest book, How to Love Someone Without Losing Your Mind. He lives both in New York City and LA. Couldn't pick two better cities myself. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And uh, what you said was beautiful. I love everything that you said. That was really great. Be a better person for someone that you love. That's what we want to do. Yeah, that kind of feedback is really helps us grow up. I'd like to begin with your Instagram handle, your diagnosense. I'm not sure if I said that right. It's Which diagnosense, is, like nonsense, the word. Nonsense, excuse yeah. me. No, All right. Which is based on an interesting idea that it's important to avoid the traps of insta therapy labels, diagnoses, and red flags. So share with my audience about this. Uh, about the handle, about my yeah. Instagram. And your um, ideas I mean, about labels. Uh, you know, the name is from Girl Interrupted. So it's a scene in a movie um, when Angelina Jolie asks Brittany Murphy, what's your diagnosis? So that's where that comes from. But, uh, you know, it was a satirical kind of jab at how we often label and diagnose things um, that maybe don't need them. Or maybe we should think a little bit deeper about what is implied in a diagnosis and how it can often be a very political and financial label more than a clinical label. But so um, I started my Instagram account five years ago. Uh, it was just mostly coming from a personal place. I was dating and I was bored and I wanted some creative outlet. Um, and I started to just post in response to some of the posts on social media that were really lacking a lot of nuance, that were listicles of, you know, you are codependent if you meet these five criteria. Um, so cultural diagnoses and pop psychologies. Um, so I started posting about that and it just kind of um, naturally grew into um, me posting about a variety of things from dating, relationships, love, sex, all of the things. So um, that's what I do every day. I write a little post, I throw it up there, um, hoping to get people to think a little bit wider and expansively about the way they love, how they have sex, and who they are. I love that. I really do. How can people identify and overcome negative patterns they've adapted from childhood? Or how we overcome our emotional ghosts, as you describe it in one of your t in the title of your newest book? Yeah, emotional ghosts, a chapter in the book. Um, well, I mean, you so you were saying it yourself, and you were talking about you know that you're the most self aware one, or at least you're self aware, and um, that's where it really starts. We have to really get to know ourselves, and it's not just our story; it's our parents' story and their parents' stories. It's the intergenerational story, and unfortunately, most of us are raised in families where we don't tell stories. Um, we don't tell our children where we came from. Maybe we'll share some positive things, but usually it's communicated behaviorally through dynamics, through attachment. And so if we want to overcome childhood trauma and repair some of those wounds, um, we have to develop a real deep connection to who we once were and our stories. And so that can be done in therapy, journaling, reflecting, but it does take an active approach. So, you know, you have to actively work on developing that awareness like you would if you wanted to teach yourself how to play guitar. You know, you'd have to, maybe you'd get a teacher and maybe you'd get a workbook, you practice skills, you'd probably put a lot of effort into it. Maybe you'd watch a YouTube video. Um, so developing self-awareness is no different. It's a skill. And so it's something that can be developed and honed and strengthened over time, so long as you put in the work. Um, but to me, that is, you know, once we develop self-awareness, that breeds um, more opportunity to make better decisions. Um, we can make better decisions. And really, our actions are the only things that we can control. Um, once we know ourselves a bit better, we can make decisions that are more congruent with what we want, with who we are. Um, and our relationships will also benefit from that, too. Yes. Years ago, I learned to stop asking people if they had heroes or heroines because they would look at me blankly. Yet heroines were especially important to me to help me define who I wanted to be. Would you talk about how we become rather than find ourselves? Because that's something I completely agree with. 
Yeah, well, I mean, at first I was like, oh, it just sounds better. <laughs> um, but it really captures, uh, I think, the deeper meaning of what growing up means and what getting older means is it's not like we find something and then that's it. Um, it's not like you find a partner. You have to really put a lot of work into it. Uh, and so when it comes to who discovering ourselves, one, that's a process that happens throughout our lives. There's no end to that until you die. Um, and two, you do have to put in effort to become who you want to become. If you have a goal, if you have a relational experience, if you have a piece of yourself you want to explore, you can't simply just find it. You do have to really put in the effort and the work and the intention behind it. Um, so I thought it was just, you know, just a touch just a touch closer to what we mean when we go looking for ourselves. You know, we're looking to become something to grow into um, rather than to just simply find and, you know, be done with it. Okay, so now I want to explore why the good enough relationship beats the perfect partner. I especially loved reading this because I completely agree. Well, I mean, the perfect partner doesn't exist. Um, you know, no one's perfect. Everyone is so, so, so deeply flawed and limited. And I'm including myself and literally every person on the planet. Um, that's just who we are as human beings. You know, we're imperfect. We fail. We disappoint. We frustrate and annoy. And so if we are constantly trying to find a partner or cultivate a relationship without those fundamental flaws, without the fundamental humanity of it all, we're going to be looking forever because it doesn't exist. So the alternative to that is to find a relationship and a partner that's good enough that for the most part, you know, they only annoy us or piss us off 30% of the time um, or 40% of the time, whatever we can tolerate individually. I mean, I think everyone says there's this one kind of number, but everyone has a, a different level of tolerance and different levels of desire of what they want in their relationships. Um, the idea of something being good enough is that it's good enough. And whenever I say this, people often say, oh, I don't want to settle, blah, blah, blah. We all have to settle. And settle does not mean settle for a shitty relationship or something unhealthy or abusive or unsafe. By no means do I mean that. But again, I mean something that's good enough where most of the time it feels satisfying, you feel content, um, and you and your partner get along. Um, and we do have to do more work and understanding um, uh, in knowing the role that tolerance plays. The tolerance, forgiveness, compromise, and negotiation plays in relationships because it's huge. And unfortunately, no one really talks about the idea of tolerance. And, you know, most people are framing that as something really unhealthy. But the reality is that we have a fun of tolerating that we need to do in any kind of relationship. And if we cannot, and again, not tolerating abuse, not tolerating being mistreated and um, a mean partner, but tolerating limitations, tolerating disappointments, tolerating when our partner just, you know, can't be there for us. Um, it's a really big piece of relationships. Um, and it's a, it is part of the relationship that's good enough. Yeah, I think that one of the things I appreciated when I was in India, I asked everybody I met about their arranged marriage, and everybody mm -hmm. had been in an arranged marriage at this period of time in India. And I really enjoyed the enthusiasm people had about the relationships. And there was one cab driver and he said to me, my sister spent two years finding somebody and they know me better than I know myself and it's been wonderful. And I thought a lot about it and decided that not having as high expectations, sometimes love seems to drive these ridiculous level of expectations. And there's just really something important about understanding tolerance is absolutely. My husband and I were carrying a chair down the steps this morning and there was a construction worker right there and I looked at her and I laughed and I said, yeah, we don't work well together. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We don't. It's, it's just <laughs> absolutely true. I have no shame about it. It's just who we are. And tolerating those things and understanding them, I think, is so important. It is. And the other thing that I will say is that people are like, God, I want it good enough. I want the best. What I was saying is that it's important to tolerate, right? But it's also important to understand what we can't tolerate. So many people are in relationships and they're miserable and they're complaining and all they want to do is complain about their partner because they have something to complain about for sure, usually, because there's always something to complain. <laughs> um, but it becomes a p piece of their partner that they're unwilling to accept. 
So they're not willing to tolerate it, but they stay in the relationship. So when I'm talking about the role of tolerance, it's important to understand what you can tolerate and what you cannot tolerate and when you stop tolerating. Because I see many couples who um, simply are not tolerating their partner's limitations and aren't being honest with themselves that they're not tolerating it and that maybe they can't accept it and maybe that this person isn't good enough for them, which is also another reality that's very hard and sad to face. But it's really complex, you know, figuring out if a relationship is enough. It's a really, really complex um, thing to grapple with. And there's really no answer. You know, there, there is no formula. There is no equation that we can use and plug in or, you know, answer to the question other than, you know, to do your best and to put the most effort you possibly can into yourself and your relationship and see what happens. Okay. I think that's absolutely true. I completely agree with you. Would would you share as a sex therapist why it's important to not get stuck in the idea of sex as a performance, which I thought was valuable? I mean, you know, if you're performing with sex, you're not present. Yeah, sex is a performance. Stop performing. You're not an important. What we want to do is we really want to connect to what we like. And when we're performing, we're performing for our partner and we're fundamentally then disconnected, not present with our own pleasure. So this isn't a bad thing. Most people are performing to some extent because there is no sex ed that's quality and information that actually helps us having sex. Most of us get our information from porn where everyone are literally performing. Um, But that's not real life. Real life has to do with connecting what is pleasurable and arousing for you. And so... If you are performing, you know, you really want to pause and understand why that is. Um, You know, are you doing this because you think that's what your partner wants? Do you know for sure that's what they want? What is your history with prioritizing your own pleasure, prioritizing your own desires? Um, And then you want to explore what your desires are, and then you want to prioritize them. Um, But it can be really hard. This is when sex is about so much more than sex, and it's what we don't talk about culturally, is that sex is really a relational act, even if you don't know the other person. It is a relational act because there's another person there. And then once another person enters the story, a lot of people experiencing, are they going to like me? Uh, Does my body look good? Um, And so it becomes a place of relational anxiety for a lot of people. And in response to that anxiety, most people are then just try to put on a performance to do their best. And a lot of this comes down to performance anxiety and shame about being liked, loved, desired, and about having their preferences be honored. And so we really want to understand and write that story about, uh, about desire, about... Um, the relational anxiety specifically that comes up during sex for many people. And most people are relationally anxious. So that means most people are going to have sexual challenges that are grounded in these anxieties. Absolutely. I appreciated this quote from your book. We analyze others to avoid being honest with ourselves. Could you talk about why this defense tactic is so important to understand? Yeah, it's a really important thing. I mean, lately it seems like, depending on how much you or your listeners are on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, it's like a witch hunt out there for people that are bad, toxic, narcissists, um, or just jerks. Uh, Most of the content is focused on saying why other people are bad. And it's training everyone to then be on the lookout, be hypervigilant and what then fundamentally happens is we're focusing on other people's stories. We're analyzing other people. And we may not consciously be doing it to avoid ourselves, but that's the result. The result is when we focus on somebody else's story, the further we get from our own. And so I don't, it's not intentional. I think it's a cultural, social value that we are all stuck on some, we cannot mind our own business. But it's really important that we do, because once we stop focusing on someone else's story, it opens up room for us to focus on our own. Even if that person is a jerk or a toxic narcissist, we can better connect to ourselves when we're focusing on our own story. And so, you know, I do this, I catch myself all the time. And I know that everybody does. We all like analyzing other people, especially now psychology and wellness is so trendy and we want to diagnose everybody and we want to understand everybody's behavior. But unless you're willing to have a serious conversation with the person and ask, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time 
Maybe they don't even know. So there's no way that you're going to know. And if you're not their therapist, stay out of their mind. You know, the best thing that we can do is to focus on ourselves, like we were talking about before, and really developing self-awareness, not other awareness of our assumptions and how we project our own biases on how we interpret the way we see other people, because it's all fundamentally biased projections. Um, so we want to focus on ourselves. We want to develop a better connection to ourselves. Absolutely. So often I hear clients are upset because they lose themselves in relationships. Explain why disagreement is crucial, which I totally agree with, and the concept of differentiation as leading to true intimacy. Well, this is how we grow in relationships, um, is we push our partners um, and we push ourselves. We become better versions of ourselves. They become better versions of themselves. But you know, it's David Snarch that uses the example, and I quote this in my book, that, you know, the ideal couple is not in the same boat. They're in two separate boats, rowing together, but getting more distinct um, next to each other. And so I really, I, I think it's a great analogy because so many people are like, we're in the same boat, we have to be on the same page, blah, blah, blah. But that's a ratio, you know, in terms of um, you end up negating yourself, you end up losing yourself. Um, if you fuse with your partner. So a differentiated relationship involves two separate individuals. It doesn't mean two disconnected individuals. It doesn't mean two avoidant individuals. It doesn't mean one individual who dis disregards the feelings of it. It just means separation. Separation in terms of feeling, understanding, and thinking. And a real deep appreciation and ability to honor the difference in that separate thinking, feeling, and wanting. Meaning, you know, your partner doesn't have to want the same thing that you do. You don't have to be in the same good mood at the same time. You can, one of you can be in a bad mood and the other one can be in a good mood and you can hold on to your good mood or be in a bad mood. You can eat two different things at dinner. You can want to go to two different places and negotiate it. Um, but it's actually these differences, negotiating them or disagreeing around them, you know, that is at times how we keep ourselves intact and how we stay our independent self. Now, again, I really do want to emphasize that a lot of times we talk about independence in relationships or differentiation in relationships, that people do go to this place of, um, you know, real independence and disconnection. A differentiated person doesn't have to disconnect in order to access their independence. A differentiated couple stays connected while maintaining their independence. And that's the trick, is that I see many people, many couples... And they're doing one or the other. They're enmeshed. They're super codependent. They have no identity without the other person. Or they're completely avoidant, not sharing, not open, and doing so in service of independence. And that's not independence. That's avoidance. So it's really important to make a distinction between differentiation, dependence, independence, and avoidance. They're all very, very different things. Um, and something really crucial to work upon because um, I'll see a lot of couples that are really not doing well because they're so, so, so separate. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for together, two, two individuals together as an us, as a we. How do we know if it's too bad to stay or too good to leave? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Again, no relationship should be abusive. No relationship should make you feel physically unsafe. No relationship should be dangerous. Well, that aside... Um, this is so subjective, you know, doing what I do and seeing couples and individuals, you know, I've really come to respect a diverse presentation of relationships that some people, they don't, they, you know, they have affairs and they don't tell each other and they're fine with it. Some people don't want to talk and process their emotions. And there's so much shit under the rug, um, that they could barely walk, but they say they're satisfied, you know? And so I don't want to push my agenda on anyone. You know, it's up to each individual and couple to decide what their relationship is good enough, what that means to them. Um, but so many times we can get to this place of, you know, I want to leave. I don't want to leave, but I don't want to stay. Um, and what do you do there? I get so many questions from people on Instagram being like, I'm here. What do I do? Um, you know, as if I have the answer for what they're supposed to do. Like I could say, okay, you should leave. No, I, you know, I don't know. You know, I think that we're, we approach relationships as these kind of black and white. Do I stay or do I leave? And there is a third option. And I write about this in the book and it's the option I didn't take in my past relationship that I wish I did, which is you work on it. You do everything you possibly can to work on it. You know, I don't think couples are equipped on their own to do it. I think they need a third party, whether that's a counselor, a coach, a pastor, a, I don't know, a dog. Get someone to mediate conversations and to help moderate them. Um, read my book, read any other 
influencers book. Everyone has a book these days. There are courses for couples. Again, you want to approach this problem of to leave or to stay like you would a skill like you want to learn teaching yourself the guitar. You want to Google something, you get a workbook, you get a coach, you try to figure it out. Um, that's the third option. You try to work on it. And then after you do all of that, you decide as a couple and you have to be open and honest with each other if it's actually working. And this is what I meant about what can you tolerate and what can you what what is not something that you're willing to tolerate. And that's when you have to be really honest with yourself and with your partner. Um, but the, the problem is that most people are not doing both. They're not being honest with themselves and they're not being honest with their partner. Um, and they're complaining to everybody but their partner. They're looking for a black and white solution. It doesn't work. This is a couple's issue. You have to approach it as a couple together. You have to approach it as the relationship is the guitar and you're going to figure out how to play it and figure it out or not. And so it does take a lot of effort. But I, I do think that, that, is the, that that's the answer here. <clears throat> it's not what people want, though. People want... Well, if you did this, if you, you know, I read the book, it's too good to leave, too bad to stay. I read the book when it's a time, you know, I did, I went with my past relationship. I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't go to therapy though with my, with my ex, which was a mistake. Um, but that option is something that feels counterintuitive when you're at that place. Well, I don't, what's the point? Why go? Whatever. And uh, you don't have to feel hopeful to go to therapy. That's true. So many folks feel that their feelings are everything. And can you say more about our emotions are not always valid? It's really torture. I mean, my I'm in a new relationship and we have very different texting styles. And um, I will have uh, very powerful reactions if I don't hear in a time hear back from him in a timely manner. And those emotions are ridiculous at times. I mean, sure, I could get a response a, a little bit quicker. That's for sure. Um, but the intensity with which I feel has nothing to do with him. This is about me. And that's not to say that those feelings aren't valid. But, you know, in the past, what I would do is I would text him. Why haven't I heard from you? What are you doing? I don't even understand why you, you're on your phone. I can see you're posting on Instagram, blah, you know. And um, I would be fully invested in my feelings of what the, he's not texting me back. Um, but the reality is, is that some of us have this thing called trauma <laughs> and it has a way of entering our relational dynamics in the here and now and tricking us into believing that the intense emotions we feel are about only the here and now are about only our partner and how they've wronged us or disappointed us or a friend or a parent. But our feelings are very complex and usually at times, especially the powerful ones, grounded in a really deeper story than they didn't text me back then. And so the more we invest in our feelings as being 100% truthy, you know, the further away we get from actually understanding them. So it's not to say that they're, I say emotions are not always valid because it's kind of punchy. They're valid. They're just not valid in the way that we often think they are. They're valid in a deeper story with which they suggest when they are really powerful and overwhelming. And we just have to find the valid story. Yeah, recognizing the exaggeration because we kind of want our way and we believe our viewpoint is the one that really counts because yeah. we all have self-interest. And relationships are about blending both viewpoints and having respect and figuring it out as you're describing. Pain, disappointment, and conflicts are not something to be avoided. Why? which I completely agree with. You said pain and conflict? Pain, disappointment, and conflict oh. should not be avoided. Why? Yeah, I mean, it's often harder to avoid conflict because it comes up and it just builds and escalates until something that we actually can't avoid. And then, you know, we have those feelings that are really powerful um, come up and nothing good comes out of that. Uh, so in terms of conflict, um, don't avoid it. <laughs> conflict is a good thing mm -hmm. um you, you know up. it is how you grow up it's how you grow together or apart this is how you maintain a connection to yourself and conflict means communicating in a nice and respectful way maybe your voice gets a, a little bit louder but you do your best not to scream and yell and throw things and you express disagreement or you express your disappointment and you push and you challenge and you ask for more and if it's just your partner that's initiating this, you have to honor and respect and listen to them too. Obviously, we're human beings. Sometimes we might get defensive. That's okay. But it's important to recognize when defensiveness comes up. But so that's conflict. Conflict's important. We need it. That's how you negotiate your relationship. Um, not a bad thing. 
Um, what's also equally as important with conflict is how we repair and put conflict down. Some people want to harp and harp and harp and revisit and rearbitrate, and that's just not helpful either. We have to focus on, okay, we had our fight. Now, how are we going to make nice? Um, and then you have to develop the skills together as a couple to make nice. Whether that's just an inside joke, maybe that's a hug and a kiss, maybe that's sex, maybe that's going for a walk or playing with the dog. I don't know. But you have to figure out with your partner how you make nice, and you have to make nice. <laughs> um, and so that's conflict. The pain part, that's how I end the book. The last chapter is called Give Up Hope, and I talk about the necessity of pain and suffering um, in terms of a piece of our life, a universal aspect that we all experience and what it means to be alive um, is to be in experience pain that, you know, we, and this is, I think, one of our biggest problems culturally, socially, um, I would say globally, but let's not, I'm not going to go that far, but um, that we operate under the assumption that we should be healthy and we should never have any problems. And that if we do, it's because we did something wrong or they did something wrong or something's wrong. Um, when the reality is life is really hard and we're going to experience pain and we have to accept it and tolerate it and welcome it. Um, I do think that this is a huge problem. I struggle with it. Everybody struggles with it. Who wants to feel pain? Um, but it's a part of life. People grow old and die. We lose people. We break up. We're heartbroken. We meet somebody else. We get together and we're then we break their hearts. You know, this is just the flow of life and how things go. Um, and we have to have a different relationship with pain or what happens is we just suffer. We suffer. Why is this happening to me? We grasp. Why didn't they do this? Why can't they? I never, I can't understand why my father wouldn't blah, blah, blah. And we suffer and we keep asking these questions and grasping and looking for answers as to why we're in pain. And so this isn't a, to say, don't look for self-awareness, be aware, um, but be aware that your pain's there for a reason and you can learn something from it. I feel like at this point I'm going on and on and on, but uh, uh, it's a very important part of life is the pain that we experience. It's just as universal and important as happiness and contentment and anxiety and all of the emotions. Including disappointment, which I think is just an an ordinary thing. And sometimes we treat it as if it's extraordinary. I mean, it's so impossible. I mean, the level of disappointment that I can feel is really wild. It's just like the, my body like goes to this space where I'm like, how am I this disappointed? They didn't, it's not even that big of a deal. But you know, this is again, this is about trauma and this is about self-awareness and understanding why disappointment can feel, as you're saying, so extraordinary, so large. You know, and the largeness of the disappointment sometimes that comes up in our relationships is so meaningful, is so meaningful um, and can really teach us a lot if we're willing to pause the intensity of our disappointment and think deeper about you know, who am I really disappointed? When was I really disappointed? What is this story really about? Why does this bother me? You know, what is this, you know, what's going on? Um, that's how we get to know ourselves. And then share it with your partner so they can never disappoint you again. What have we not covered that you'd like to add? Mm, what have we not covered? We've covered a lot of great stuff. You know, I would just say one thing in terms of um, ending relationships. It's an important thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, but developing the capacity to end a relationship and to honor it as well is really important. Um, culturally, we give a lot of attention to the beginning of relationships. We celebrate it. Anniversaries and love, we have Valentine's Day and uh, bridal show. You know, we have all this shit that celebrates love and the beginning of relationships, but nothing um, that acknowledges the real depth, the pain, and the growth that happens at the end of a relationship. We grow and transform just as much at the end as we do at the beginning. And the sad part to me is that most people feel shame. They feel like they failed and... Um, uh, they get embarrassed. They don't want to talk about it. They should have moved on yesterday. Um, but the ending of a relationship is really important. It's a place of growth. We then have, we usually, if we are able to explore what happens for us, we're able to take what we learn and we make better relationships. Our next relationship, we, we grow. So um, I really want people to reframe the way they're thinking about relational endings. It's really important. Great. Please remind my audience the title of your new book that's come out on June 4th, I believe, and where they can find you. It is called How to Love Someone Without Losing Your Mind, and you can find me on Instagram at Your Diagnonsense. All right. 
Thanks for tuning in to this episode. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your feedback helps us create better content and reach more listeners. You can follow me on Instagram at Rhoda on Couple. Thank you for listening to What Healthy Couples Know That You Don't. If you have enjoyed the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes and help get the word out. To learn more or connect with Rhoda, visit therapyideas.net.